the arrow, time passed. See, now it's about time for me to stop preaching in some of your minds. But you see, when the time has passed, it's gone, isn't it? We, Jane and I traveled on Interstate 74 today. It's already gone. Not the interstate. The time. That's how we use that time. It's gone. It's over. Now there's another thing. The neglected opportunity. When we had an opportunity. You see it in here? It says, make the most of every opportunity. That's the second one. But that's four things that go past. The spoken word, the arrow, time passed, the missed opportunity. I can still see it, and I think I told you about it, but it comes to my mind and heart, and I'm not happy with it. I had to ask God to forgive me because I missed an opportunity. One day, a friend and I, on a Saturday afternoon, were out visiting people, and there were four or five men on a porch, and we were looking for somebody, and we didn't know where, when I said, where's such and such an address, and they told me someplace else. You know what I should have done? I should have gotten right down there. They were right there on the front porch. God was speaking to me to do it, I didn't do it. They were there on the swing. And I should have gone up to the front porch and began to talk to them. Say, well, have you lived here long? Um, what kind of work do you do? Not trying to be nosy. I just asked them about it. I did. I said, I had that. I said, where is this address? They said, oh, someplace over here. And I should have talked to them a little longer. But I didn't do it. In my heart, I knew I was wrong. And I had to ask God to forgive me because it was a missed opportunity. I won't have that opportunity again. I had to ask God to forgive me. I was sorry for doing that. I had to ask Him to forgive me. Okay, now, we say make the most, it said, the first one, be, be very careful how you live. Make the most of every opportunity. At the end of verse 16, because the days are evil. They're evil. Now I got to thinking today, there are about five, oh, there are many more kinds of narcotics or drugs. I think when I first started hearing about the wrong use of drugs, some of you are pharmacists, have been pharmacists, or pharmacists, but the wrong use of drugs. Well, I think of marijuana. Right? Sure. They talk about mar That's probably the first one I heard about. Marijuana. Then I heard about cocaine. Then I heard about heroin. Then I heard about meth. Now it's a big long word. I, I can't tell you the long word. All I say is M-E-T-H. Meth. Now I hear about another one. It's called spice. S-P-I-C-E. And some states and towns are trying to outlaw it, and that's a new drug. Uh, well, at least it's new for me hearing about it, that people use it in the wrong way. So the days are evil. You know, I think about a guy, a man by the name of Mike. He, he doesn't mind his whole name. He'd let you know, he, he would want you to know it. Mike Hinkle. And he came to Jesus, and after he came to Jesus, about two years later, his wife, Patty, died. And they have two sons that are about 17 and 20. Well, Mike, he lost a job because he used drugs. He was wrong. He knew this was wrong. But it's really hurt him. Because where he lives, he tried to go back and tell them there were others using the drugs. I have stopped using drugs. I don't use them anymore. I would like a job. Don't give him a job. No. They won't trust him. Even though he's become a Christian. He's a nice guy. He's my friend. But it really cost him. 
Was there our evil days? That's true. Well, there was a group, a small group, in a Bible study prayer group, and they said, we need to take action. The days are evil, they're tough. Days are tough economically. They said, we should help more people. So they had what they called a weatherization project. Don't ask me how to spell it, okay? Weatherization project. What they do is they find widows or widowers or a mother with children and she cannot do the work and they weatherize the house. You know, they put, they caulk, they put caulking and they put weather stripping and maybe they get a different door in the front so that the threshold is better and so that it's not so cold in the wintertime. The weatherization project. Well, the days are evil. And so they said, we need to do something about it. We need to help people. Okay. Now we read also, do not be foolish. Doesn't it say that? And in start of verse 17, do not be foolish. Don't be foolish. Okay. We always need God's guidance, don't we? John chapter 16. You don't have to turn to it. You may want to make a note of it. In John 16, one of the many functions of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth. If we find truth... He will guide us into... That's one of the functions of God, the Holy Spirit. He will guide us into all truth. Okay. Now, I remember one day, a man by the name of Rich. I asked Jane today when we got here in the parking lot, and I said, I wonder if we still have our car manual. So there's two or three. And I should have read it, but I haven't read it. I failed. <laughs> I haven't read this word for word. It's a car manual. About three of them in a car. When you get a car, sometimes they have the manuals in there. Something came up the other day and Jane said, well, we really, you really need to read the manual. <laughs> That's right, I do. Now, Rich had a manual. Rich is a mechanic. That's his name, Rich. Rich Weininger. He's a mechanic. His son has his own building, his own business as a mechanic. What is a Christian's manual? You got it. I read your lips. Bible. B-I-B-L-E. There it is, isn't it? Now, we also read in here, in, it's in verse um, 17. Understand God's will for you. Oh, we, that can get kind of rough, isn't it? To understand God's will, we must be willing to have him tell us and teach us about his will. To understand God's will for us. Have you ever read Mark, any writing by Mark Twain? Okay, good, Mark Twain. That's good. Mark Twain can be very humorous. Mark Twain, he said this. It's not what I understand about uh, what I don't. It's not. It is not that I don't understand in God's word that bothers me. If I don't understand something in God's word, it doesn't bother me. But he said, if I understand it, then it really bothers me. He has a good point, doesn't he? Because you know what? I read in the Bible where it says, "Love your." enemies wow you mean I'm to love the guy at school who makes fun of me who grabbed my cap and flushed it down the stool I'm supposed to love that guy I want to punch him in the nose <laughs> to love your enemies then it says, encourage one another. Then we read, uh, love your neighbor. Be kind. Wow. Well, understand what God's will is. To ask him to show you his will. And to do the things he said to do as a Christian. 
and then what he wants us to do, to be open. All right, but it also said in verse 15, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is a command. He didn't say, maybe be filled with the Spirit. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I will give you five options. One of them is to be filled with... No, he didn't say that. He said, be filled with the Spirit of God. Now... In other words, just sell out completely to God. Don't hold anything back. It's simply by faith. Well, in your outline, number seven, Paul teaches us three life-empowering lessons. Three lessons. Uh, Tom Raimondo shared these, and I, and I share what he shared. And I'm just sharing what he shared. He said, the truth of the Spirit-filled life T-R-U-T-H. Truth. T-R-U-T-H. The truth of the Spirit-filled life. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. Be filled with the Spirit. He said, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, what in the world is debauchery? Well, that'll make you go find and look in the dictionary, won't it? <laughs> well, as I understand it best, debauchery is extreme. It's not like in the average. It's extreme. Extreme indulgence. Extreme doing. In sensual pleasures. Extreme. I mean... Sometimes I open magazines and, or watch on television and they'll say extreme something. And maybe they'll go do bungee jumping. And they'll put it to another level. And I read an article this week in a magazine and it's about surfboarders. They're extreme in this. The, the ones that try to walk, they try to find the highest wave and get up there somehow. 60 foot high, I couldn't even believe it. I thought 10 foot maybe, but 60 foot, and then they talk about 100 feet. They get weather reports from their friends and they say, let's go to this country. In two days you have to be there because on this beach, the wave is going to be this high. And we want to be there in the action. Extreme. Now, when we think about, Paul talks about, he contrasts about getting drunk with wine and it produces a temporary high. It might even get somebody extra strength for a little bit of time or courage. But he said, be filled with the Spirit, which is, in fact, lasting joy. See, getting drunk with wine is the old way of life. And then we find... There's a better joy. Be filled with the Spirit. It works. It takes care of monotony and tension and frustration and depression. Now, uh, when a person is drunk, did you ever hear about the, the what is a person when he's in drunk? I know um, if you're driving drunk and you get caught, it's called uh, DWI. Thank you very much. That helped me. That helped me a great deal. Driving under the influence. D-U-I. Thank you, Dr. Kim. D-U-I. Well, when we think about this, um, driving or you're living under the influence. If we're drunk, living under the influence of spirits or alcohol or an addiction. And we need to be under the influence of the Spirit of God, under His influence to, to go and to live. The truth of the Spirit-filled life. Now, being filled with the Holy Spirit may sound to some people like scary, it's weird. No, it need not be. I don't know if you ever read by Mr., or you might hear him on radio, Mr. Charles Colson. 
He's on breakpoint. He is a very intelligent man.